for the backend study group. Um, my name is Prachi and my co-host here is Elaine. Um, just the, if you look at the screen, these are just like some uh, some instructions for you to uh, to attend this meetup, the Zoom meeting. I'll, I'll move forward and we can talk about the agenda a bit more. Um, yeah, so those of you who you are not completely familiar with the Women Who Code, well, welcome. Uh, our mission here is to inspire women to excel in technology careers, right? Our vision is a world where women can hold technical and non-technical careers and excel at them, right? Uh, today's session is part two of the software design patterns session. Uh, on for April 22nd, we did the first session, which was created. We've talked about what design patterns are in, in detail, and we also talked of, looked into three of the three of the creational design patterns. Uh, today, we continue this mini series and we'll talk about structural design patterns. Next up, we have three more sessions, which will be behavioral design patterns. Then we'll look at anti-patterns and then we'll look at actually coding questions and uh, theory questions uh, around design patterns, interview questions, right? And every session, we, we briefly talk about what backend engineering is. Uh, in, in this mini series, we'll talk about what software design means and of course, structural design patterns. We will take breaks in between. Um, so for you to ask questions, we'll also do like a discussion. And if you have something, you can always unmute and ask a question or you can put it in the chat as well. So yeah, quickly, uh, what is backend engineering, right? So backend engineering basically is something that the user or the customer or the client does not see, right? So it's something that is behind the scenes, right? Uh, your servers, your applications, different systems, all of that is considered backend. It's pretty huge and uh, it's a whole domain in itself and it encompasses many different things and it has an overlap with uh, data engineering, uh, 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 distributed systems, developer operations, bunch of other things, right? So basically what we do in backend then is we design and we build and we maintain server-side web applications and systems. We create APIs, we create databases, we maintain those systems. We do deployments, availability, performance, bunch of other things we also need to uh, keep in mind. Therefore, I say backend is huge and uh, uh, each of these, uh, like thinking about storage, thinking about distributed systems, thinking about performance, each of these is like, like very deep uh, subdomains in them in themselves. Uh, let's quickly now talk about uh, software design. Uh, so, what is software design and why do we need it? Right. So, for in order to build um, good backend systems, by good I mean efficient, I mean performant, I mean makes most use of resources right, systems are available, we are able to monitor them, it's easy to debug, it's easy to log, right? It's easy to provide uh, features for customers, right? Uh, build good features for customers, fast APIs, right? We need to understand what, how the systems are and what's the best way to design them, what's the most efficient way, right? So defining the architecture of a software application or a system in itself, which may or may not have different smaller systems, microservices, bunch of other stuff, right? Databases, right? So we need to think about the architecture, you know, think about how we'll modularize these systems, uh, separation of concerns, right? How will we build different interfaces uh, for these systems to connect? And what does the data look like? Every system pretty much deals with data. So we have to define like what the data looks like and how would we share that data, right? How secure it is. A uh, bunch of other things. So usually we do design to like solve a problem or uh, build a product, right? So let's say you have uh, 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 you work at Tesla and you want to create a new feature in the in the software in the Tesla software car software. So your product owner will come and tell you, let's build this new product or this new feature. And uh, so you'll think about like this is the technology stack we have, this is the systems we have. How can what does the feature look like or the new product looks like, and how can we design a better system around achieving that goal, right? Sometimes it's also solving a problem or a bug uh, you build something now you need to scale it you can't scale it so that's a problem now you need to again maybe redefine the architecture or make some changes in your system design to make sure that this problem of scalability is not solved 
right? It's supported. Your systems can now scale. How would you want to do that? So all of that includes design, architectural design, system design, software design, bunch of different things, right? So uh, at the very high level, if you want to start design from scratch, you would think about what the system input is, what the system output would be, what would the business rules be, and uh, what's the data schema, right? What does the data look like during this interaction? What does my input data look like? What does my output data look like, right? If I'm processing my data using the business rules, what does that look like? How am I storing the data? How am I securing the data? So these are some very basic uh, uh, concepts that you need to think about when you think about like design, software design in general, right? Today we'll look at some of the design patterns that solve these common problems. So uh, design patterns are basically there. They are, you can consider them as templates. They give us some basic uh, template or some basic solution to common design problems we know uh, in the software world. Uh, so these are some templates you can begin with. They may or may not exactly solve your problem, but they can act as something that is, which is very basic, which you can build on top to actually solve your problem or build that feature, right? So these, they are more like references. Um, um, when you also think about like design, there are, uh, you can break it down into three types too, like uh, UI design, UI here is user interface, right? So how does your data look like? If you have a website or a mobile app, uh, what data you show on your website may look slightly different from what you show on the mobile app because the screen is small. There's only limited content you can show and you don't want to, uh, uh, disturb the user by showing a lot of information, right? So your data visualization and presentation will look slightly different given these devices, right? So you need to understand what that user interface design and experience looks like. Uh, also data design, like I mentioned before, how are you representing your data and how are you storing it and how are you sharing your data? It's uh, actually a very, very important uh, part of um, uh, software design. Also process designs, design. So things like uh, what kind of backend validations am I doing, right? What kind of data manipulation I'm doing? How am I, how are my business rules? Uh, how am I implementing them, right? In my, in my product or in my service. And again, uh, storage of data because uh, your system can interact with different systems to get data and store them. So you need to also think of all of that, all of those interactions. And that's where the process comes into picture. Like I have two microservices, they both interact to each other uh, for achieving five different goals, right? Uh, or five different features of this entire product that I am working on. So that's where the process comes uh, uh, into the picture. So yeah, let's uh, look at like, design patterns a bit uh, more in detail. Um, uh, like I said, these are like set of template solutions uh, which can be reused, which can uh, be applied to solve a problem or, or build a new feature, right? You can always build on top of these. So they are not, uh, they are not supposed to be used. Uh, uh, like that template solution is not necessarily fixing your problem exactly there is more that you can do with this given template solution on this given recommendation, right? Uh, usually it helps improve code maintainability, reusability and scaling because these design patterns are curated in a way that they address these issues uh, uh, in design, right? Uh, we will look at like, design patterns mostly, at least in Java, we, they, of course, they leverage the object-oriented principles uh, for flexible and maintainable designs, right? So interface, sorry, uh, uh, inheritance, polymorphism, uh, abstraction, and encapsulation, and some other concepts too, which we'll look a little bit later, is what they heavily leverage or rely on to come up with these template solutions. Uh, like I mentioned before, these are just recommendations. It's not like a library or framework which you just add to your code and boom, like you're done. That's not how we would want to see uh, a design pattern. It's not a library really, it's just some recommendation and then you can do some code restructuring on top of it to address your, your requirements. Uh, yeah, and uh, for most part, at least in object or in programming, at least in Java, design uh, patterns define a lot of relationships between objects. Uh, right, how objects interact with each other, what is the runtime behavior, um, uh, the structure of it, uh, the creation of it, bunch of different things is what design patterns do. It's all catered around objects, right? Because it's a Java, it, it's Java or it's an ob object-oriented programming uh, principles. It heavily relies on that. And to the right, we can see that uh, there are three major types 
of uh, 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 design patterns, creational, structural, and behavioral. We looked at uh, three of the uh, creational design patterns during our last session. Today, we'll focus on some of the structural design, some of the most commonly used structural design patterns. And next session, we will look at some of the most common used uh, behavioral design patterns. Um, let's quickly talk about the different types. Uh, so creation design pattern focuses on uh, object creation, right? How is the class initialized? How are the objects of that class uh, instantiated, right? Uh, what are the attributes set? What is the default behavior set? All of that is what a creation design pattern cares about. Uh, it doesn't care about like what the actual implementation would look like as the as the as the as a life cycle of the object through a system. All it cares about is how is the right way to create initialize the class and instantiate the objects. Right. Uh, in the last session, we looked at the singleton factory and builder design patterns. Um, quickly moving to structural design patterns, they focus more on the class structure and composition. So, okay, now you initialize your class and you insert it to the objects. Now, what does its behavior or structure will look like at runtime, right? Uh, you can create different objects and they may end up having different structure and different behavior at runtime. And uh, well, how would that look like? So these design patterns help us focus uh, on that kind of a problem. And uh, this helps us with like code reusability. This focuses heavily on functionality too of these objects, right? And uh, this way, if there are any large objects and there are like, like loosely, loosely coupled uh, uh, relationships or even tightly coupled relationships between objects, we can better handle these relationships. And uh, today we'll be looking at the adapter, decorator, and the uh, bridge design uh, patterns, which are more common. And the third one is behavioral. It focuses more on like the communication between different classes and objects at runtime. And uh, uh, there are many. We will look at a f I think a few in the in the in the next session. So yeah, Q and A time. Um, can you in one line or just like in the chat or just unmute and just like summarize what a design pattern is? Uh, what's a creational design pattern or what's a structural design pattern? And can you come up with some real life example um, that uh, that is like a structural design pattern or like creational design pattern? Feel free to unmute or put in the chat. No answers. Creations focused on object creations and factory. Yeah. Design patterns are. Yeah, Anjana, you're right. Uh, Ellie, Elizabeth, um, are reusable designs for common problems? Yes, that's correct. Um, certain, co like if, if, if you want to solve a problem of what's the best way to create objects or best way to so best way to instantiate objects or best way to initialize your classes then you can refer to one or two of the uh, creation design patterns as a template solution and that should solve your problem so you don't have to come up with your own design of how to do it there is already a design pattern and you can totally leverage it and I think Python also has design patterns. Uh, they are somewhat similar. Some, some of them are different. Uh, even with .NET, uh, some of them are different. And uh, uh, most of them, though, it's also object-oriented programming with .NET, so uh, with C-sharp. So most of the design patterns are similar. Creational pattern example catalog. Oh, how, how can you create like a catalog, different catalogs? Thank you. Okay, um, moving forward. So uh, I felt like we should quickly revise some of the other basic concepts of object-oriented programming. We did uh, we did in very detail uh, look into inheritance abstraction and encapsulation and polymorphism last week, uh, but it feels like a revision, a very quick revision of some other concepts uh, is gonna help with uh, today's session. So, uh, some of you were familiar with object-oriented programming. This is a very quick uh, and nice 
uh, summarized revision of it. Uh, folks who are not familiar, we look at the uh, code in a little bit and uh, hopefully that helps you understand uh, what these concepts mean and what the pattern uh, is in action, right, in the code. Uh, so uh, inheritance and, super, and, and the super keyword. Basically what we do is uh, with inheritance, we have a subclass and we have a superclass. So the subclass or child class inherits the attributes and methods of the superclass uh, or the parent class. So for example, like, uh, like fruit, right? A fruit has a like color taste, um, it has uh, some other properties, right? Like, uh, what's the uh, what's the lifespan of the fruit? Like, how much time does it need to grow, right? Something like that. Uh, now, if I that can become the superclass, and then I can uh, create a subclass which is like mango or apple or something like that, which has all the properties of fruit, but it can have some some additional properties too, right? So uh, that's like a, some very basic example of like the superclass subclass relationship where every subclass is a superclass, uh, right? And and therefore derives all the attributes uh, and methods of that uh, superclass or parent class. Um, super keyword we use in Java inside a subclass, inside the constructor. That's the first line actually uh, by rule that we need to add. And what the super does is it helps us um, pass any attributes from uh, the subclass to the to superclass for doing any um, uh, function for implementing any functionality. So uh, uh, yeah, so that's like basic, very, very basic inheritance. Uh, uh, and uh, let's move to polymorphism. So polymorphism basically means like, uh, like many forms. And what we do is we have the same method, uh, but different behavior. Now, polymorphism is broken down into two different types. Uh, we do uh, overloading and overriding. Overloading means uh, um, in the same class, you have, uh, you have like, let's say two or three different methods of the same name, but the parameters will be different. So let's say I have uh, uh, in the in the fruit class, like I have, uh, uh, maybe that's not the best example. Uh, let's say I have a class where I have a method called get name, right? Uh, it can have, I can have the same method name, uh, but the parameters would be different. Like one get method name has, no arguments, no parameters. The other will have two, and the third one will have like let's say four parameters, and it it does something with it does some functionality with those parameters, right? So uh, that is called overloading. Overriding is a, a method signature uh, here, uh, meaning the name of the method and the list of parameters, right? So uh, the order and the name and the type of the parameters is exactly the same. So therefore the method signature is exactly the same, but here there's a concept of inheritance. So that method signature is the same in the super class or parent class and in the subclass uh, or the child class. And so polymorphism is implemented in these two different ways, uh, right? So uh, moving on to abstract class. So uh, this I think is very important for today's session because uh, in, in, in object-oriented programming, you can create uh, uh, abstract classes and concrete classes. So um, quickly, what does an abstract class mean? That you can define some variables and you can define some uh, methods, but you don't, uh, uh, sorry, you can declare them, but you don't really define them. So you don't uh, set the value of that variable. And when it, it's a method, you don't def uh, define the functionality, what the method does. You just mention, you just declare the, the uh, variable and the method, but the implementation will depend on the, the class, a concrete class that actually extends this abstract class. Concrete class means uh, a class where uh, variables are initialized, right? Or they are set. Um, uh, methods have uh, a definition, like if there's a method, we will actually have a proper functionality of what that method is supposed to do. Uh, so there is a concept here of declaring variables and methods and actually defining them, uh, right? We'll, we'll look at the code and hopefully that will make it clear for you. Uh, and uh, when it comes to abstract class, uh, on, 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 you can always only extend one class or one uh, one um, uh, abstract class, and if you define the uh, you also define the method in the abstract class, just not declare it. 
then by that, what you're doing is you're setting some default behavior, uh, which will apply to all the objects or all the classes that are extending this abstract class. So that's also one way you can set default behavior, right? Like if you are creating an, uh, a, a card object, right? By default, you can make sure that the price total is always zero to begin with, not null, not some other value. It's zero dot zero. So you can always initialize that field or you can always make sure that uh, begin with uh, uh, that as a default value, right? So you can set it in the variable or you can set it in the method. So that's, there's a lot more that goes into abstract class, but at least for today's session, uh, these are like the main benefits of what, uh, why we use an abstract class um, and how it's different from a concrete class. Uh, we should also look into an interface. Uh, an interface only has abstract methods, meaning that we never, we only declare the methods that can be that will be common across all the classes that will implement this interface. But we will never define all the classes implementing the interface can have their own behavior of what that method is supposed to do, right? And we use the implements keyword um, in the code uh, to implement an interface or to reference an interface, right? So here actually there is a polymorphic behavior where uh, every uh, class implementing one or more interfaces can uh, have its own version of what this uh, implementation will look like, what this behavior for that respective class will look like. Uh, yeah, um, we we'll look at all this in the code in a little bit. A uh, few more concepts to quickly revise. Uh, so composition. Uh, composition here is uh, when a subclass cannot exist without a superclass conceptually. So there is a very strong connection or association between a, a subclass or a child class and a superclass or a parent class. So uh, one example would be a tree, right? A tree is a superclass and it has a branch, leaves and fruit subclasses. A fruit by itself cannot exist without a tree, right? Or leaves cannot exist without a tree or a branch cannot exist without a tree, right? So here it's a strong association. Uh, aggregation is uh, somewhat the opposite where a subclass can independently exist without a subclass, of course, conceptually. So there is a weak association. For example, vehicle superclass is a driver subclass. A driver can exist individually. Vehicle can exist individually, but when this particular driver is uh, driving that particular vehicle, then there is this weak association established with, between them, right? Um, is a and has a, that's also something to look into. Uh, is a basically is, a, it signifies inheritance where uh, uh, a subclass is a type of superclass. So mango is a fruit, right? and has a composition is where an object has a relation with another object. So for example, like a bookshelf has a book. A book is not a type of a bookshelf, but a bookshelf has a book or a kitchen has a, a microwave, something like that, right? And unified modeling language is just a diagram representation to visualize the design uh, of a software, different classes, uh, different objects, relationship between objects and classes. And, and we'll look at a couple of UML diagrams a bit later um, in the session as well. Um, quick Q&A. So um, Elaine, if you can stop re the recording. Uh, can you summarize? Thank you. Um, yeah, OK, so structural design patterns. So today we'll look at adapter, bridge, and dec decorator design patterns. Uh, they are most widely used. So let's try to understand what these mean and why they exist, right? So uh, with adapter design pattern, basically what this helps us is it helps us uh, uh, wrap objects so that their implementation is not visible and uh, two different objects or two incompatible objects can now, given your system, they can still interact, right? So uh, an object adapts to the interface of another object and therefore they can now interact and share data, right? What this helps us is reusability. So let's say if I have a third kind of object, which is incomp in incompatible from the two objects that I already have in my system, all I need is an interface to connect them. And now I can just share uh, data with all these incompatible objects, right? I can have relationship with these objects in my system, right? For, for, for data flow, for, for uh, object behavior, right? So what this does is it separates the interface uh, from the business logic. And uh, uh, 
what we can do, what the way you can view is like if you have a different, if you have a new client integration or if you have an, uh, a system that is slightly different, all you need to do is you need to add an adapter, which will ensure that uh, two incompatible objects can can interact, right? Can still communicate and share data, right? So um, uh, what we need here in the code, at least is an adapter class. And uh, what that does is uh, um, it, it an adapter is what it does is ensures that there is like two different interfaces for these two different incompatible uh, um, object types and it wraps them so how that object implements certain methods and and how that object actually processes data we don't care about them or that all we care about is like how ensuring that this data between two objects is shared and uh, we'll use like interface and like adapter methods to 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 uh, to implement like the structural design pattern in the code. So if, if you see to the right, there are like two uh, diagrams. Uh, the first one is what uh, we have in the code. Like, let's say we have a class that uh, gives us some health metrics data, right? Now, let's say we want that for Apple Watch and Fitbit. Then we can, we these are very two different objects and they the way they store, the, the way they have the data schema and the way they calculate like health data is different. And we still want uh, this one class where given whatever the, the type of uh, 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 device here is, it will still give us health data. It will still give us my account details for, for the respective uh, um, uh, devices here, right? So that's what the adapter helps us do. Um, and uh, the second example here is uh, um, basically like uh, you have, uh, uh, two different APIs, uh, one deals with XML and one deals with JSON, your service still should be able to interact with these two different APIs to get the right data, right? So your service at the, at the API integration level will have different adapters to make sure that uh, whatever the type of response you get, it can adapt to it and it can still uh, map the data. So let's look at uh, the code example quickly. Um, Let's see if I can share my IDE. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is the font okay or should I increase it a bit? It's good. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's look at the adapter uh, uh, pattern. I have this adapter initializer class, which is my, which is, which, which is the, uh, the class which will begin the whole implementation of the adapter design pattern, right? So like we saw in the diagram, I have this health metrics data, and now I want to get uh, my health data for Apple Watch, and I want to get my user account details for Apple Watch. And uh, I also have a Fitbit. So now I want to get my health data uh, in Fitbit and uh, what are my user account details in Fitbit. Now, how am I supposed to implement this, right? So what we do is um, at, the, at the very beginning, let's, let's step down a bit. What I have done is I've first and foremost defined enums, right? Fitbit, Apple Watch. Tomorrow, if I have Alexa, I will just add Alexa here, right? And, and boom, I'm done. Right, so I can add more clients, different kinds of objects here that I want and uh, make sure that I, I'm still able to get the health data. I'm still able to get uh, my user account details, right? It can be any, any other device in the future. I should be, should be, my application still should be able to get me this, uh, uh, this data, right? So um, there's, there's a presentation mode. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, is this better? Um, Let's see. So what I'm doing is uh, let's look at the Apple Watch and Fitbit class first, right? What do they do? So uh, I have two variables here, uh, which store the health data and the user account details. Uh, for now, I have just like uh, set them at the constructor. Uh, so it's easy for me to uh, implement the this adapter pattern. So every time I, I get the health data, this is what I'm going to get. And I have like the getter and the uh, 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 setter methods and I have this like get health data for Apple Watch and get account details for Apple Watch, which are right now it's just printing uh, what I what my details are and it's returning these fields right. So it's very basic, very simple class uh, here. Uh, 
Uh, similar with Fitbit, that's what I'm doing. I'm setting my health data and account details and this get health data method for Fitbit and uh, the account details for Fitbit just returns, uh, just logs this and uh, just uh, returns my, uh, my account details and health data, which I have set in the constructor, right? So these two classes are very simple. We can now look at the, um, let's look at the media interface um, and get out. Yeah, so here, what I'm doing is uh, no matter what my device is, I want to get health data from it and I want to get user account data from it. So what I've done is I've created this interface uh, which has, uh, where I have uh, declared these two methods and any, any media type, Apple Watch, Alexa, let's say Fitbit, some other health device, whatever the device is, they will, all of them, will have these functionalities because that is what my my uh, domain here is or that is what my feature here is no matter what the device is we should be able to get the health data and we should be able to get the user account details right so this is some shared functionality across all media types so interface helps me uh, just declare uh, the shared functionality and every media type media type being fitbit or apple watch will uh, implement this separately so get health data will look um, here, will look different for Apple Watch and will look different for Fitbit. So what I have now done is I have this adapter class uh, and this is what the, the magic here is. What my adapter class does is it implements this media interface. So it ensures that whatever the media is, we will provide uh, the functionality to get the health data and get the account user details, right? So we are ensuring here by implementing this interface that the behavior across any media type or across any device uh, will be similar, right? Because that's what we want. Um, so what here we are doing is uh, basically, um, this is a constructor basically, but like what we're doing is given a media type, uh, you return me uh, an object, which is either a new Apple Watch or a new Fitbit, right? So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm setting this field, uh, advanced media type here, is just another interface which will uh, help me with uh, adding more functionality than than what I already have. So what I've done is like this advanced media here ensures that it, it breaks down that given a, a media type, this is exactly what the method should be. So when my my app at the front end is only uh, uh, cares about Get me the health data. But this is what the implementation behind the scenes is. Do you want the health data for Apple Watch or for Fitbit? And this is where we define the code implementation uh, of what these exact methods look like. So this becomes your, this interface uh, uh, ensures that uh, what exactly the implementation methods are across your different media types. If I had Alexa here, then I would have two different methods added, which should be very specific to Alexa. Right, so this is what uh, this interface is actually doing. So when I look at the advanced media, so what I'm setting is given a media type, I'm gonna create a, a new instance of that media, right? And uh, based on that uh, media type, what I'm doing is I'm ca calling either, if it's an Apple Watch, then I'm gonna ca uh, call the Apple Watch health data. If it's a Fitbit, then this is the health data, which is a method at the at the first layer, right? You don't know what that implementation looks like. You all you care about is you're getting the health data and you are mentioning that get me the health data for Apple Watch. But how is it implemented actually? Like uh, how do you ensure in the back end that I need to indicate with Fitbit to do this, or I need to indicate with Apple Watch to do this? And how do the methods and, and the data points look like, right? So based on the type. I'm ensuring that you get the health data for Apple Watch because how they calculate this is different versus the whole integration with Apple Watch is different than what the integration for Fitbit would be. So get health ensures given a media type or device, what's the right integration to do, right? What's the right object to, uh, uh, what's the right method here, functionality to initialize to get the health data, right? So this is the power here, like given a media type, the interface, uh, using the interface uh, and the adapter, you know what exactly the method is to call. And same with user account. If it's an Apple Watch, then call user account details for Apple Watch. Uh, if it's Fitbit, then you call that method. Now let's see how this is, um, how this is implemented. So here, so if you look at uh, the interface, right? Um, yeah, so, what, so now you see, right? It's basically calling this method 
these two methods that were defined in my uh, in my uh, Apple Watch class and Fitbit class, right? So I, they are not named Get Health Data. They are named Get Health Data for Apple Watch. Tomorrow, if I want to add more features or more methods and functionality, I can totally do that. And the implementation will look slightly different uh, from an Apple Watch to a Fitbit. So this is what is actually being implemented. You were just like using the interface and adapter, you were calling the right device or the right media type and you were calling the right methods. But their implement here the implementation of get health data is different from what the implementation for Fitbit looks like. Right. So this is this is the benefit uh, of, of using um, an adapter uh, and an interface. They're two different compatible objects. You can still leverage them to to meet your functionality, right? So in my adapter initializer, what I'm doing is I'm just providing the Apple Watch or uh, Fitbit, right? So if I click on Get Health, what it's doing is depending on the uh, on the type, uh, it's calling uh, the Get using the media adapter. It's calling the uh, Get Health method, which is basically at this point in this flow that I shared. It's calling the Apple Watch, and if you see. This is how it's implemented. So it's going to print this. So tomorrow, if I have to add new media type, just I have to update the enum and I have to update the interfaces only if I have more functionality. Otherwise, just uh, uh, add an enum here, create a new class for like if we have a class for Fitbit, we have a class for Apple Watch, create a new class for some other device and uh, implement these methods, right? Because that's the functionality you want. And just and, and just define what these methods are actually supposed to do. How is that new device or media type uh, implementing uh, the health data, or how are they giving us the account details? Um, yeah. Do you have any questions? I had one question. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was wondering for uh, like the method. In the class, in the previous class, where I think it's the media adapter class, yeah, uh, or maybe not this one. Um, yeah. But basically, uh, the implementation had like the Fitbit implementation also had um, methods the Apple, that yeah. were done null for the other. Yeah, other yeah. This is because yeah, this one right. Uh, this is because you are implementing this common interface. That is the that is the uh, that is how you basically implement because you are using this common interface for both media types, and that is where your adapter, the concept of adapter, comes into the picture. What you do is you because you because these are the rules of interface. You need to define. You need to override these methods too, but you are not doing anything Fitbit related here. So they will always return null because these methods will never be called. Similar with Fitbit, because you are implementing that interface by the rules of uh, uh, interfaces, you will need to uh, implement all the methods, right? You override all the methods, but because uh, this is not related to Fitbit at all, therefore you return an all. And this method will never conceptually be called in the realm of Fitbit, right? In this example, yeah. So that's a good observation, but that's how uh, it's implemented. Good question, Sherpa, thank you. And in the future, if I had let's say Alexa, then I'll have these two methods for Alexa too. But in, in Apple Watch and Fitbit, they'll be set to not because that's not the realm of Alexa, right? These classes are not. Um, here are the rules of uh, 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 interface apply in the language. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Prachi, I have one question. Yeah. In this itself, what if we don't have that in the advanced media, like the two redundant methods and just keep the, uh, we just don't define as for Apple Watch, but we just keep two methods, which will just give the health data and health uh, data and health data for Fitbit. Okay, sorry, user yeah. account details. Yeah, the problem with that is like, Couple of things, right? First is uh, you have two different implementations. The whole idea of adapter is to kind of like hide the implementation, but still be able to establish the interaction. So at one point you need to define uh, what exactly the implementation looks like. Am I trying to get the health data 
like if you see here, right, adaptive initializer, am I trying to, uh, uh, what does the implementation look like? It's, it, it might be different for Apple Watch, whereas it might be different for Fitbit because they calculate health data separately. So you have to define in your code where exactly that implementation is and what that looks like. And because these have common uh, functionality, therefore we are using interface, right? But the implementation is different. So that's where this interface is helping you. At one point, you have to be very clear about what uh, what class or what media type you're referring to uh, to get the health data, right? And that's why I have re renamed this to like for Apple Watch or for Fitbit. And that this is what tells me that this is, uh, even if I look at the code, right? Like when I'm trying to get what the implementation, I'm not gonna click on Fitbit because it's gonna be null, right? I'm gonna click on uh, here, uh, the Apple Watch because that's where the implementation is, right? So uh, mm -hmm. you define the flow of uh, what the exact implementations looks like. So you have some abstraction and then uh, using adapter and using interfaces, you ensure that two different uh, media types are still able to interact, right? Like you are still able to get the data from them, but their implementation looks totally different. Okay. Just to be yeah. on the separation, like separating the both the media types. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I did run the build. Where was it? So yeah, as you see, right? So. I'm getting the health data for Apple Watch and then user account details. So it's just printing what I had set in the constructor in the in the Apple Watch class and the user account details, which I had uh, set in the constructor in this example in the Apple Watch. And then for health data for Fitbit, uh, this is what I have. And my user account details for Fitbit uh, look like this, right? The data is different. Here it's username, it's, it's first name. That's what Fitbit returns. Here, Apple Watch only returns account creation date. Uh, uh, and the username, but Fitbit returns the first name and account status, which are with different data points, and the implementation will be different. Same with uh, uh, Apple Watch, right? For for Apple Watch, the health data means body temperature and oxygen saturation level, but for Fitbit, the health data means rest uh, resting heart rate and age. So this way, I don't have to define what. Uh, also, another benefit is I don't care about what exactly fields I'm returning as long as. Um, um, whatever the system gives me, I'm just returning at the front end, right? So I don't care about what health data exactly may it look like. All I need is give me the health data because I'm gonna do something with it. It can be different for different devices. And, and that's like, that's the power. I was still able to in, uh, interact with different devices and, and get their data, which can be different, right? So they are incompatible uh, devices, right? They are different. The data looks completely different but they have common functionalities like giving health data and user account details. So we, we are leveraging that, right? Any questions? Okay. We can move on to the Q and A. Uh, of, of what do you understand by adapter pattern? And if there are any real life examples that come to your mind? I, I wanna get done with like in the next half an hour so we have some time for questions too, right? Um, so yeah, the next uh, 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 design pattern, structural design pattern is bridge. Uh, now what bridge does is uh, it uh, separates the abstraction from the implementation. So what you can do here is basically you can develop like loosely coupled or hierarchical uh, objects where you don't care about like the implementation details, but the objects, uh, the structure can still, uh, you can still interact and the structure can still slightly modify, right? So basically uh, the client or your front end, your mobile, whatever, it will, uh, it will uh, access this middle layer, which is like an abstraction uh, and doesn't care about what the, the backend implementation looks like, right? So there, there, are, there are a couple of ways in, uh, in to, to implement the bridge pattern. We'll, we'll need abstraction and we'll need like uh, interface or implementer, right? So what we do is we make sure that uh, the abstractions takes care uh, of, of declaring the operations, but delegates the implementation to a concrete uh, class, right? Which will actually, uh, Remember I said declare and define, which will actually define what uh, the implementation should look like for that given concrete class. 
which has uh, which has referenced this abstract class where we have just uh, declared operations, right? So the implementation is delegated to concrete classes. Um, it will also refer to like uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so we have like this concept of ab uh, abstract class and concrete class to to establish this abstraction, right? And the other one is implementer. What uh, implementer basically what that does is um, um, it will ensure. Uh, the flow of actually implementing the functionality, right? So using the interfaces and concrete classes that reference this interface to define the implementation. And that's what, uh, uh, so using an abstraction and uh, so an abstract class and an interface is how we will achieve the bridge design pattern. So one real life example can be like a Lyft app, right? It has like a driver login and a rider login. We don't care about what, uh, what the flow of driver or rider is right but if i'm a driver you should make sure that i i am able to log in using the driver credentials and if for a rider then i'm able to log into rider credentials uh both driver and rider objects may have some common functionality like first name last name address age date of birth i don't know license number maybe not license number but some common fields but uh other fields might be slightly different depending on what that domain object looks like and the methods for implementation will also be different. So uh, one example here is this UML diagram where we have like an abstract class, uh, which is uh, just declares the functionality and then like a concrete class, which will, which will define uh, what this abstraction should look like. And there's also an interface which will define common functionalities and um, a more concrete implementation of uh, given different objects, what does that implementation should look like? Um, so let's um, look at the code. Okay, uh, bridge design pattern. So what am I doing here is, um, you can see I am trying to create like uh, different orders with different payment methods. So I have here um, a grocery order where what I'm doing is I'm uh, adding a list of grocery items right to my grocery order. And for this order, I'm, I'm using the Visa credit card as for payment. And I'm creating another grocery order, but I'm using the MasterCard uh, for payment in this order. Uh, I, if you see, I'm still creating the order at the same time, uh, same type, right? It's still an order, uh, but uh, I am choosing on the fly at runtime whether I want to use a Visa card for this order or I want to use a MasterCard, right? So this is one example. The other is I'm creating a different kind of order. Now here it's a restaurant order and I'm adding like a, a list of uh, items from the menu at this restaurant. And for the first order, I'm using a Visa card, and for the second order, I'm using a MasterCard, right? So, uh, how is how can we ensure that in runtime you can specify what this uh, what this uh, uh, payment should payment should be, right? So, if we look at the um, if we look at the order class, let's look at the order class first. So, this is our abstract class, right? This is where the abstraction is. So, what here I'm defining is that you can create any kind of order. It's an abstract class, right? So um, I am declaring two methods here. One is add items. In the case of a grocery order, my items will look slightly different, right? Uh, and in the case, conceptually, and in the case of a restaurant order, I can still add items, but conceptually the list will be different, right? So for, for any order, I should always be able to add items how am I adding items? What are the items can look different, right? So declaring it here and restaurant class and or a grocery order class will define what that looks like. And then I should be also be able to calculate the order total, right? So I have five items added to my order. Uh, how this is calculated in the grocery order versus how it's calculated in the restaurant order can be different, right? Restaurant order can apply discounts, whereas grocery order does not necessarily apply discounts. It has some points. That's what it's applied. So the way we are calculating the order total can be different depending on the type of the order, right? And here, what I have done is I have used like, I have used this payment interface, which on the fly helps me determine what the payment uh, method I want to use. So I'm ensuring that whatever the order type is, uh, it should have a payment, 
And uh, so whenever you create a, con so this is the constructor of this uh, order class, uh, because it's an abstract class, it, it can have a constructor, right? So um, I'm ensuring that any order, you should always define what the payment should be for that order, right? So if you look, so this is your abstract class. And if you look at the interface, the interface here is the payment. And uh, what I'm doing is here is just returning the name of the payment, Visa or MasterCard. It can have some different other methods too, right? Like uh, uh, validating the payment method or validating the payment type or validating the, the, the credentials, right? Validating the card. So a bunch of other stuff, right? So if it's a gift card, then if you also want to do that, uh, validate the card. So right now at very basic, I'm just like declaring the payment type uh, and uh, whatever, uh, class implements this interface will set the payment type. So if you look at uh, payment, right, it's um, here. So I've created two payment types. One is the Visa card and the other is MasterCard. What I'm doing is I have this payment type variable and I'm just setting it to Visa and, and I'm returning it on the payment. So if you see, I have overridden the payment type method from uh, the payment interface here. For a Visa card, that's what my payment type is. For a MasterCard, it's implementing the payment interface. So I have to override the payment type method and I'm setting it to the MasterCard. So that's like the power of interface here, right? So uh, together with abstract and uh, abstract class, uh, the order class and, uh, and the interface payment, I can on the fly decide what my order type is and what my payment for that order will be. Right, uh, given just limited examples here, just two types of uh, orders and two types of uh, payment uh, types or payment methods, right? So if we look at the grocery order class, uh, it's fairly simple. We have a list of items uh, uh, because uh, grocery order extends the abstract class order and that ensures via the constructor that you have to define a payment type. Therefore, in my grocery order class, I have to declare a constructor and I have to set the payment type. And this is super. So this will set the payment type here in my uh, super class, which is the order class, the order abstract class in this example, right? So every time I create a grocery order, I have to define what the payment looks like. So this is referencing uh, the payment interface here and via um, the extends keyword here and via super, it's, uh, it's sharing this payment information with my uh, super super class, which is order in this case, right? So I have these, uh, 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 because order uh, abstract class, ha class had add items and calculate order, I have to implement them. So if I look at um, uh, the grocery order class, all it's doing is uh, given a list of items, it's gonna set it and uh, calculating the order. So from this map, where double is the, the price of the order and string is the name of the item, right? So it may, uh, the price of the item and the name of the item, what, you know, what it's gonna do is like, it's gonna add all, in for all the items in the list, it's gonna just add all the price uh, price and return that total price, right? And it's just gonna print that price. It's very simple. Similarly, with restaurant order, what it does is it again has the power to set the payment because it's extending the order. Um, um, it's in the order abstract class and that uh, references the payment interface, right? And then this is similar, just set the items uh, for the order and uh, given uh, the list of items, calculate their price to uh, add all the, uh, all the price for each item and just print and return the total, right? So it's very simple. Now, if you look at the bridge initializer, so now what I have done is uh, I'm creating a list of grocery order items it's a very simple method. What I'm doing is in this map, I'm adding the price, double, and I'm adding like milk, cheddar. So my grocery list consists of milk, cheddar, cheese, avocado, mint leaves. And for restaurant order, I have, uh, this is my restaurant order for McDonald's. I'm ordering these five things, right? So I create my, I create my uh, uh, item list and I'm creating a grocery order with Visa. So I'm creating a new grocery order and setting the new visa uh, credit card, right? So what this does is in the constructor, right? So it's gonna set um, the type to visa uh, uh, for us. And uh, I'm creating another grocery order with MasterCard. Same with the restaurant order. I'm creating two orders with two different type of payment methods, right? And now if I wanna see this in action, what I'm gonna do is uh, I, I want to see the total, right? So I'm just gonna calculate uh, for each of these orders, I'm just gonna calculate the uh, order total, right? It's gonna print that. And I also want to just uh, 
print what my payment type was. So I'm clear, I'm straight up referencing that uh, order class. And then in the payment, I'm just looking at the payment type, right? Because if you see here, the order class has that payment field, it has a variable. So I can um, directly access that variable and uh, print the payment type from it. So if I run this code, um, let's see. Should take a little bit of time. Yeah, so you see uh, my first order, the total is uh, 11.96 because I'm using the same list of items for both orders, but my payment type here is Visa. Whereas for my second grocery order, the payment type is MasterCard, right? Uh, I also have a restaurant order and the total for all the all the stuff that I ordered from McDonald's is 54.95, but for the first order I use Visa and for the second order I used a MasterCard. So using an adapter and an interface, you can actually uh, determine what the uh, different type of orders would be and what the different kinds of payments you want for these different orders. So that's basically uh, uh, what the bridge pattern helps you do. So here we, we use, again, we use an abstract class and interface, but in a slightly different way. We have questions. Um, I have a question and sorry, bear with me. This is like kind of new to me, but um, is so the pattern that you just described the bridge pattern. Um, so it's also using pieces of like adapter from going from like order to each type of order, restaurant order and grocery order. But the bridge is basically connecting the order abstraction with your payment type interfaces since you also have multiple like visa and master payment types correct, okay correct. that is correct so okay. if you look at the exam if you look at the diagram here right you have an order class which is your abstraction but the refined abstraction or implementation of that is your grocery order class and your restaurant order class and then you have this payment implementer or interface which uh, the concrete implementation of that is like a visa and a master uh, classes, right? They are com concrete implementations of, of that interface functionality. And your order class is able to leverage different types of orders and is also able to, via this interface, it's able to leverage different types of payments. And that's what the power, uh, or that's what the bridge, bridge pattern here lets you do. Thank you. Thank you. Look at the code. Yeah. And that's why we have specified the payment because we want to have control over uh, what this payment will look like. And because we have different types and, and right now the payment is just, uh, uh, interface is just telling us what the payment type is, but in the future, we would want to do different validations on what that payment can be, right? Credit card or debit card or a gift card, stuff like that. You might want to do some logging. So, uh, every payment class will have its own way of implementing these common functionalities that are required for processing a payment. And, and that's what we want to do. So here, order and payment functionality is linked. And it can be different dynamically, right? Different orders, different payment types. If we move to the presentation, uh, any questions? about the bridge pattern, any examples that come to your mind? Uh, I have a quick question. Is there any uh, other example that, that would kind of um, demonstrate the same thing? I'm still trying to understand the difference between adapter and bridge pattern. Yeah, um, let me think about this. Um, I think one example, at least of the bridge would be, um, again, the Lyft app, right? Like uh, uh, the login uh, for a driver and a rider can be similar, right? That functionality can be implemented through an interface, but the behavior of what the driver does, their life cycle in the Lyft app or their life cycle in the, or, or a rider's life cycle or behavior in the Lyft app can be different. And that is what we can define through the abstract class, right? Like uh, uh, Lyft app users are two types, 
uh, uh, sorry, we have like an user um, abstract class, right? Which gives us like, we have a first name, last name, return the first name, last name, return their uh, address information, something like that. Uh, that's common functionality across any type of user. So the, that is something that we can also do, but like the behavior of driver versus rider can be different and we can have more control over that as well from uh, uh, the abstract class. So it's like two different functionalities, right? Like maintaining the order in, in that example is a different life cycle, which, which abstract class is more power over, or more control over. Whereas uh, some other piece of the functionality, which is payments, uh, it's pretty structured, it's pretty standard. So we can just set it out and here is this different type of payments, but, but the, the implementation uh, the functionality can be the same for any payment type. This is the implementation is slightly differ, differ. So an interface is a better use of, uh, of, uh, of catering to that functionality or implementing that functionality. So yeah, separation, abstract class has its own power here and caters to one specific functionality. Uh, overall and interface takes care of other stuff. So you can decide what you need to implement via interface and why do you need an abstract class here? So is there something like this grocery order? If that's your domain, then using a bridge pattern is probably a better, better uh, reference, right? And then you can build on top of it. You can have more interfaces for, let's say, uh, login information. You can have more interfaces for some other account information, whatever. Uh, you may not need, uh, you may only need one abstract class to manage the life cycle, but uh, uh, you can have many different implementations to manage bits and pieces of this functionality, right? Because you only extend one abstract class, but you can implement different interfaces. So okay. you can leverage that. So you kind of have to have both um, an interface as well as an abstract yes, class. Yes, because that's the problem you're trying to solve. Right, or that's the function you're trying to implement. Therefore, you need both Okay. in this example. You're trying to uh, solve a specific design problem here and using an abstraction and a concrete abstraction and an implementer and a concrete implementer, you can achieve this, this design or you can solve this design problem. Yeah, just think okay. about it like that. I have this design problem and this pattern is helping me solve it. Okay. And then I can build on top of it. like. Add another abstract class or add more interfaces and stuff like that. Okay, okay, thanks. That's a good question, thank you. Um, I think we can move on to the third and the last uh, 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 structural design pattern, which is decorator. Uh, decorator is uh, uh, fairly simple. What we want to do here is we want to decorate objects. Okay, think about it like that. So at runtime, we want to modify what that object's behavior and structure, uh, to some extent structure may look like, right? So it does not uh, affect the object instance. So it's not, I'm not modifying the class or uh, 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 at, uh, uh, on runtime. I'm only making sure that given one class and three objects that I created out of it, they will behave slightly different at runtime. And how they behave is what I want to define, right? That is what the decorator will help me do, right? So this, this, this removes the need for subclassing because if you think about it, like uh, let's say um, um, uh, the example I'm gonna use is like I have an apartment and uh, uh, I can use inter inheritance to define one bedroom apartment, studio apartment and two bedroom apartment. And I can, uh, where apartment is my super class and uh, these three types of apartments are subclasses and uh, I can have uh, uh, common methods, common functionalities, but then I have this association, uh, strong or weak association with, uh, with, uh, with the super class, right? And I don't want to do inheritance. I want to leverage the power of interfaces and, and abstract class here to, to establish this relationship. So what I can do is, um, rather than defining the subclassing, superclassing, I can just uh, make sure that using abstract classes and interfaces, uh, whatever objects I create at runtime, they look slightly different. So I don't care about uh, inheritance at, uh, in, in this case. And this just helps uh, uh, us to make the code more extensible and easy to maintain because uh, Again, if I have another type of apartment, then I have to do the whole inheritance and and, and follow all the rules of superclass and subclass. But with uh, this, uh, with with the decorator pattern, all I need to care about is okay, this is my class, and this is how it's going to behave on runtime, right? So uh, 
that's that's the power of decorative class. What we do is we basically encapsulate the concrete class to to provide like a modified functionality. And uh, what it does is it wraps or links to a target class. So we have this target class, which is something basic. That is some basic behavior that applies to all um, all the classes, uh, right? But um, these different uh, so all the objects, right? Uh, which reference to this target class, but uh, these different objects that are created will have their own different functionality too, or their own different behavior too, on top of what this base or target class uh, is providing, right? So um, yeah, and we do that using like uh, an interface. So one example is like the uh, the file reader classes in, in Java IO, right? Uh, the file reader classes can like read from a file, read from a buffer, like there are different implementations of it. And this is like one good example where it's not inheritance, but uh, it's just uh, depending on the type of file uh, you've provided, uh, it will uh, it will still have the same functionality and operations on on what that file is, so it can still read the file or or the content, right? So we'll we'll revisit this diagram uh, once we we look at the code. Um, so let me quickly switch. Um, can you see my screen? Okay. Thank you. Um, so here decorator so let's begin with decorator initializer so what i'm doing is i have this uh, apartment class which uh, which is everything that qualifies for what an apartment should look like let's say right or what defines an apartment okay so that's what my apartment class cares about and now i have a studio right which is like yes it's kind of an apartment but uh, a studio will have some other functionality i want to decorate my studio with some other stuff that be a basic apartment never has right so what i'm going to do is uh i create like a, a studio class right and uh uh so new simple apartment i'll i'll uh i'll we we'll look look at look at the implementation a little bit more, but I have this very basic apartment, and then I have this simple apartment class, which is something additional that uh, defines what uh, a simple apartment setup looks like. Okay, so any uh, studio apartment or one bedroom apartment that I care about uh, qualifies as an apartment, and it, it has some basic furnishing, basic simple apartment furnishing already done for me. Okay, and uh, when I move in. What I'm doing is I'm decorating my studio with a television and a desk now, right? So that's what I'm doing. Now I have this other type of apartment, which is a one bedroom apartment. It technically qualifies as an apartment, right? And it has a simple apartment. So here it is furnished with some basic furniture the, that, that is provided for any kind of apartments, studio or one bedroom in that, that community, let's say, right? So it's basically, it, 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 it has some basic furnishing. And when I move in, now I'm going to decorate my one bedroom apartment with a bookshelf and paintings. So now how am I able to do that? So if you see, it's still an apartment, but um, here I have a studio and it on runtime, it looks different, right? I have decorated with different stuff. And here I have a one bedroom apartment, but it looks very different. So I've decorated with different, uh, different, uh, different paint, like different uh, furniture, like paintings or bookshelf, right? So this is what I can do. Uh, different objects will have set a different behavior, uh, additional behavior that I can define, right? So what I'm doing here is, uh, let's look at the apartment class here. So this is an interface. So what my apartment class does is it, it lets you decorate. It. So whatever kind of apartment you have, you have the power to decorate. And what you will decorate is you will decorate uh, it with a list of items that you want. And string name here is just to specify what that apartment name is. Right? We'll, we'll look at the code and you'll understand. So any apartment you should be able to decorate. Okay, uh, now let's look at a simple apartment. So simple apartment implements this interface. And what I'm able to do here, I'm sprinting it now, but think about this decorate method as like, I'm adding basic furnishings to this apartment. So any apartment which, uh, uh, which uh, uh, any type of apartment, which extends simple apartment will have basic furnishings set up. So there will be some basic furniture and all the required utilities will be all set and ready for you to go. Right? So you can come and move in here. And uh, so you have basic furnishings and then you can decorate it as per your needs, right? So uh, any apartment you should be able to decorate and, and, and a simple apartment means it's furnished. 
in this example, right? And uh, you use the same method, decorate, because it's a type of an apartment still. So using the decorate uh, method here, you, you over it, uh, wrote it, and you are setting up uh, uh, some simple furnishings and, and ensuring all the utilities are, are connected, right? So now let's look at a one bedroom and a studio and one bedroom. What the studio apartment does is, oh, it just sets a list of items that I decorated the apartment with. And uh, because I'm extending the apartment decorator, it's, uh, let me actually step back. Let's look at apartment decorator first. So here again, yeah, it's an abstract class. Now what this is doing is it's implementing the apartment. So we should be able to decorate, um, um, decorate the uh, the apartment right so uh, it cares about what the kind of apartment would be a studio or a one bedroom or a two bedroom that's what you said in the constructor right and given the uh, apartment what it's going to do is it's going to decorate it so given the type of apartment and given the list of items you give it it's gonna decorate that respective apartment with that list of items so this is what the adapter uh, the here sorry this is what like uh, a decorator, you can call it an adapter too, but like this is what a decorator helps us do is uh, given a type of apartment, you can decorate it uh, as you feel like. You can add any list of items, right? So um, if you look at the studio um, class, it's, uh, it's extending that abstract class, right? So now we can set in that abstract class, now we can set the kind of apartment we want, right? So it will be a studio in this case. So using the super, we're setting that apartment and because it's set at this field, it's going to call the respective decorate method. So in case of studio, it's going to call the decorate method of the studio class. And this is what it's going to call. And using super also, I am setting the items and the, the name, right? And I'm just printing it here. Same with one bedroom. Uh, it extends the apartment decorator. So you set the type of apartment and the decorator will make sure that it's calling the exact um, um, uh, decorate item when you are trying to add this new, uh, uh, this list of uh, decorations or furniture to your one bedroom apartment, right? So yeah, um, if we look at the decorator initial as a class, so what I did was I created my list of furniture, I created it, uh, an apartment, which is studio, I initialize this to be a new studio apartment, and I'm ensuring that uh, this studio apartment has some basic furnishings. And once this basic furnishings are done, then I'm decorating it with a television and a desk, right? And this name is just to, for printing purposes, which you'll see. So I'm just setting it as studio. And same with one bedroom. It should be furnished at the very basic. It's an apartment, which I can decorate, right? Using the decorate method. And I'm ensuring that the simple apartment using the decorator method from the interface is able to do basic furnishings. And then I'm adding like a bookshelf and painting to this, uh, this, uh, this one bedroom apartment that I have. So all this behavior basically, if you see is then same object type, if you think about, so for same class, different objects, different functionality, different behavior, right? So we are decorating a studio, we are ensuring that basic setup is done. And then I went ahead and I added a television and a desk. And then I uh, also got a one bedroom and then I ensured that basic furnishings are done. And then I also added like a bookshelf and a painting to my one bedroom apartment. So you are you able to like decorate your objects or change their, uh, so you're not really like, you're not adding like a bookshelf. So if you look at one bedroom, right? You're not adding a field bookshelf. You're not adding a field paintings to it. You're not modifying the structure, but your uh, one bedroom apartment still uh, conceptually has uh, uh, your uh, bookshelf and painting. These are not actually variables as a part of your class. You're not modifying the structure, but you are ensuring that the behavior of this object um, on runtime is different. Same with studio. Uh, you're not changing the type of, you're not changing the structure of studio, neither are you changing the structure of apartment to add a, a television and desk, but your studio still has television and desk, whatever you want to decorate. That, that object with. Do we have any questions? Um, yeah, just to summarize, we looked at uh, structural design patterns uh, today. 
where the focus was on the structure, was in the composition and also somewhat on the behavior too. Uh, we looked at the adapter design pattern, which, which focuses on solving the problem of incompatible ob objects in your system, uh, the data sharing or gathering the data from these different objects uh, and, and establishing an interaction in between them. Uh, the bridge design pattern ensures that your abstraction is slightly different from uh, your implementation. And the decorator uh, design pattern helps you modify the object's behavior at runtime without really modifying the structure of, of, of that object entirely. Uh, so yeah, that, there are other design patterns too, but these are like most common use which we looked at today. And in the next session, we'll continue this design pattern mini series. And uh, on June 3rd, we will look at behavioral design patterns. It is the third type of, of design patterns in the object oriented programming world. I've also shared uh, some resources in the presentation. So if you look at a women who code uh, uh, backend study group on GitHub, you should be able to see today's pre this presentation already uploaded in the meetup events. Uh, the demo code that we looked at, you should be able to reference that demo code as well. And we have a woman who code a YouTube channel, so you can refer to our first session, which is what is back in engineering, uh, our, the other two sessions that we did, including the creation of design patterns, which was the first in this mini series, and uh, some other resources that I shared, uh, which are referred to uh, for, for creating these presentations and mini series. Uh, and also we have a women who code Slack channel. So we can also, if you have any questions, you can ask that if you, if you want any resources, uh, feel free to directly tag me or Elaine and we can, we can help you in any way possible. We can share resources as well. And yeah, Elaine has already shared the links to uh, the GitHub, the YouTube channel, the Slack channel invite, and uh, a list of all women who code SF events. So you can look at uh, the next three sessions that we have already set up uh, in this mini series of design patterns. And also we have this feedback form. So as you can see, this is the fourth session. Well, actually the fifth session of, of um, backend study group. So if you have any ideas, if there are topics that you want us to cover, uh, then uh, do share them and we'll try our best to uh, have sessions on those topics, including looking at the theory and hands-on coding as well. So your feedback would be much, much appreciated. Thanks, Elaine, for sharing the links in the chat. No problem. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Stopping the recording now.